Hello everyone. Today we are going to see a very interesting topic that is the cerebellum. Let's get into the topic. We are discussing in our CNS lectures wherein the motor system is being discussed and cerebellum. Today we are going to discuss. Cerebellum we will be discussing under the following subheadings. That is the functional areas of the cerebellum, then neuronal circuits of the cerebellum. It is nothing but the inputs and outputs of the cerebellum. Then functional units of the cerebellar cortex. There are some layers in the cerebellar cortex which we have to understand it very deeply. Then functions of cerebellum, then cerebellar dysfunctions. This functions of cerebellum, cerebellar dysfunctions, we will make a separate video because they are very, very important. Now, today we will be discussing the functional areas, neuronal circuit and functional units of the cerebellar cortex in detail. So, coming to the functional areas of the cerebellum, anatomically there are several divisions in the cerebellum, but we are not going to go into the details of it. Functionally, it is divided into certain lobes and certain zones. So, cerebellum, all of us know it is the largest part in the hind brain. And all of us know that that for major function of cerebellum is the coordination of movement. We will try to understand how this coordination happens and is there any other functions for the cerebellum, what will happen in the cerebellar dysfunctions. So, coming to the anatomy, the cerebellum is basically divided into anterior lobe, posterior lobe and flocconodular lobe. So, these are the divisions, but functionally it is divided into longitudinal sections. It is divided into three zones. These are called as functional zones. Longitudinally, the central most portion is called as the vermis. It is called as the vermis. And next to the vermis, it is called the intermediate zone because it is in between the vermis and the lateral zone. So, it is lying intermediate. So, it is called as intermediate zone. The so, second zone is intermediate zone. Then the third zone is lateral zone. Our entire discussion will be based on these zones only. The central portion is the vermis followed by intermediate zone and followed by the lateral zones. So, coming to the function of this vermis and the intermediate zone. As you can see here, there is some representation I have given here, which is not exactly like a homunculus, but the peripheries, these are nothing but I have represented it like the limbs. Here you can see that the limbs. There is not a proper homunculus representation in the cerebellum, but it has something similar to that of the homunculus that we saw in the motor cortex and sensory cortex. So, as you can see here, the vermis has the central portion of the body. So, the vermis is involved in controlling the central portion of the body. That we can say it that axial portion or the axial muscles of the body. Whereas, the intermediate zone, the intermediate zone is having the limbs. So, they are basically controlling the limbs of the person, limbs of the person, like coordination of the limb movements. Then coming to the extreme zone, that is the lateral zone, here I have not done any representation at all, because this area does not have any homunculus representation, but it has a huge number of collection of neurons which is passing and entering and exiting this region. So, what will be the major function of this lateral zone? The lateral zone is exclusively involved in coordinating all the motor sequences that is done by the cerebellum. So, this zone is actually very, very important. And below these zones, there is one separate area which is called as the flocconodular lobe. It is an association with the vestibular apparatus and it is also involved in the balance of the person. So, now coming to the neuronal circuits in the cerebellum. The neuronal circuits in the cerebellum, basically there are some inputs to the cerebellum and there are some outputs to the cerebellum. And everything that is entering in has to reach some nuclei. These group of nuclei are called as deep cerebellar nuclei. And from the deep cerebellar nuclei, some of the outputs will be going out. And when these uh, connections are entering, they will be entering the cerebellum through different regions. Like some are entering superiorly, some are entering in the middle region and some are entering inferiorly. And these are called as connections are called as superior peduncles, middle peduncles and inferior peduncles. So, now let us discuss in detail about the inputs and the outputs of the cerebellum. So, coming to the inputs, the cerebellum receives inputs from the higher regions of the brain as well as from the periphery. Before going into all these connections, just we have to remember one thing. What is the function of the cerebellum? For example, in simple terms, the motor cortex, suppose this is the motor cortex, the motor cortex is like a hero or he is like the master in the house. So, what he will do is, he will be sending some impulses to the peripheral muscles and performing the action. But at the same time, this muscular actions blueprint, like how the action has to be done, will be sent to some other person that is nothing but our cerebellum. So, first thing is the cerebellum is receiving inputs from the cerebral cortex. 
Next, what the cerebellum is going to do with this blueprint? First thing is it will observe the ongoing action. Suppose I want to pick up a water bottle which is on my right hand side. What happens is this is done by the motor cortex, the motor planning is done, then I will be trying to pick it up. But if there is some error, I just move my hand a little away. Somebody has to find out that I am moving somewhere else. So, and this information from the peri periphery will not again go to the master because the master is, has employed some other people for this function. And this error first will go to the cerebellum. So, from the peripheral muscles, it has to go to the cerebellum. So, from the periphery also, the motor impulses are constantly going to the cerebellum. Now, what the cerebellum will do is, it has the blueprint also. Now, it is having the image of the ongoing action also. Whenever there is a mismatch, what it is going to do? It is going to correct on its own. For this, there is no need to send the impulses to the motor cortex or the master in our picture. Here, the cerebellum will act like a manager and he will control the ongoing movements and adjust it to the according to the needs of the person. So, it has to have inputs from the cortex also and it has to have inputs from the periphery also. So, coming to the inputs from other regions of the brain. One tract is very very important. If you don't remember all of it, but still you have to remember this one tract that is cortico ponto cerebellar tract. It is the most important tract, cortico ponto cerebellar tract. All the blueprint that I was saying, it is carried by this only and it has to enter to the cerebellum. Which part in the cerebellum is more advanced? It is our lateral zone. See here, it is going into our lateral zone of the cerebellum. So, this tract is going to the lateral zone and they are in coordination with the cortex and they help in coordinating the movements of the person. Now, coming to the other tracts. Already I have told you that floconodular is involved in vestibular apparatus. So, vestibulocerebellar tract will go to the floconodular lobe. And there is one another tract which is called as reticulocerebellar tract. This is the reticular activating system which is giving some information to the cerebellum. And this goes to this central portion. This central portion is nothing but a vermis. And there is one more additional tract which is olivocerebellar tract. It gives impulses to all the zones like the lateral zone, like the vermis and the intermediate zone. Now coming to the impulses from the periphery. From the periphery, two things I have to know. First thing is the ongoing action, whichever action is being performed, that has to be told to the cerebellum to compare it with the blueprint. Second thing is the first the position of the body. Somebody has to first tell me what is the position of the body to the cerebellum so that it can alter the movement. For example, if I have to change the body's posture completely, then that has to be sent to the cerebellum first. So, constant information about the position of the person has to be sent to the cerebellum. So, it is done with the help of two tracts that is two dorsal tracts and two ventral tracts. What is the function of this dorsal spinocerebellar tract? This dorsal spinocerebellar tract receives information from the proprioceptors. And what is proprioceptors? We have already done our sensory system. Proprioceptors are nothing but our muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs. So, this information from the muscle spindle, it is constantly updated to the cerebellum. So, cerebellum always knows what is the position of the person. Then, what is the function of the second tract? That is ventral spinocerebellar tract. This is the most important tract which I was talking about. It sends the ongoing information directly to the cerebellum to compare it with the blueprint given by the cortex. This gives an efference copy. So, this ongoing information copy is constantly sent to the cerebellum. This ventral cerebrospinal tract is the fastest tract in the body. Its speed is around 120 meter per second. If you convert this into hours, it will be like 432 kilometers per hour. It is traveling at the very rapid fast. That's why whenever any action is performed and there is a little minor error also, the cerebellum immediately tries to correct it. And if there is a cerebellar dysfunction, what will happen? This moment to moment corrections will not be done by the person. Now coming to the output signals from the cerebellum. The output signals goes first to the deep nuclei. From the deep nuclei, it goes to the other regions in the body. So, four deep nuclei which are present in the cerebellum are dentate, emboliform, globus and fastigial. This emboliform and globus, they are together represented as interposed. So, now there is a single name for both of them that is interposed. Interposed means it is in between the dentate and the fastigial nuclei. So, all this nuclei will carry the information from the cerebellum to the other areas. Out of this, the dentate is the most important one. Now, tell me from where the dentate has to take the information. 
obviously which is the most important zone in the cerebellum that is the lateral zone so from the lateral zone as you can see here from the lateral zone the information is carried by the dentate nucleus and it gives to the thalamus and finally this information reaches the cortex so that coordination with the cortex be, can be done instantaneously next thing is from the vermis there is one nuclei which is going to the fastigial nuclei from the fastigial it will go to the brain stem and the reticular formation centers then finally from the intermediate zone just remember eye for eye intermediate is going to the interpost and finally it goes to the thalamus and it causes reciprocal contraction what is this reciprocal contraction for example if i am flexing my biceps what has has to the has been to the triceps it has to relax so that the flexion can be efficient so at the same time the agonist muscles are going for contraction and the antagonist muscles are going for a relaxation this is done with the help of this interpost nuclei now coming to the functional unit of the cerebellar cortex so whenever cerebellar cortex is divided and the layers are being studied there are several layers in the cerebellum and the three most important layers are nothing but the molecular layer as you can see here the first one is the molecular layer second the purkinje layer why it is called purkinje cell because the cell bodies of the purkinje cells are present in this layer here i have written p this p is nothing but the purkinje cells and some more cells are present which is down below which looks like granular in appearance and they are called as granular layer and it also has a very similar cell pattern that is granule cells so the three layers in cerebellum are molecular layer purkinje layer and granule layer and there are five cells in the cerebellum the most important one is the purkinje cell and purkinje cell is the only one which is inhibiting the deep nuclei so this central portion which we have drawn here is nothing but our deep nuclei this deep nuclei is the one which is giving the output finally so this deep nuclei is stimulated by everybody else except for the purkinje cells and now let's talk about the other cells the first thing is purkinje cell we have discussed the second cell is the granule cells this granule cells what they do is they receive their fibers and they form this molecular layer like this they extend their fibers and form the molecular layers and this granule cells are stimulatory to the purkinje cells so the granule cells also can stimulate the purkinje cells now coming to the inhibitor cells there are three inhibitor cells namely the golgi cells this golgi cells directly inhibit the granule cells they are going to inhibit the granule cells and there are two more inhibitory cells which are nothing but the basket cells and stellate cells so this b for basket cells and s is for stellate cells so this basket cells and the stellate cells it is very funny like granule cells whenever they are directly stimulated they are going to stimulate the pyramidal cells but they in turn stimulate the basket cells and the stellate cells and which both of them inhibit the pyramidal cells so this kind of feedback mechanism is called as feed forward inhibition it is like the granule cells is inhibiting its own impulse so this feed forward inhibition can enhance the signals according to the situations that is available now let's discuss about two important fiber group which are controlling all this cells this two groups are very very important the one of them is called as the climbing fibers another one is called as the mossy fibers this climbing fibers what it does is it gives an excitatory impulse to the deep nuclei as well as the purkinje cells see the action will be different whenever it is giving excitation to the deep nuclei the output is going to go but at the same time whenever it is giving impulses to the purkinje it is going to inhibit the deep nuclei why this is happening let's try to understand in the next slide next group is mossy fibers rest all inputs rest all except the inferior olivary nucleus rest all information from the cortex and the brain stem areas goes through the mossy fibers this mossy fibers also gives stimulatory input to that of the deep nuclei i told you both the climbing fibers as well as the mossy fibers they are going to stimulate the deep fibers and this climbing fibers will be producing a spike potential which is a complex in nature so it is also called as complex spike whereas the mossy fibers are going to produce a simple spike potential so now let's try to understand why all these things are happening so coming to the mechanism of signal excitation and inhibition why there is some excitation as well as inhibition for example let's take the climbing fibers whenever climbing fibers are getting stimulated what will happen is there will be a immediate impulse to the deep nuclei 
and the motor activity will be enhanced or the motor correction will be enhanced and immediately after that what will happen it is going to the Purkinje which in turn is inhibiting the deep nuclei. So what happens at rest and what happens at movement? Whenever the person is at rest what happens is both the Purkinje as well as the deep nuclei are firing. So there is not much of movement in the person. But during movement what will happen there is impulses from the cerebral cortex which is giving a huge impulse to the deep nuclei. From the deep nuclei the action will start and the person will be performing the action. Then immediately the second event that is happening is Purkinje fibers. The Purkinje fibers now they are going to inhibit this deep nuclei and stop the action that is the dampening effect. So let us try to understand with an example why this should happen. Suppose if the person is trying to pick up a bottle and he has moved his hand a little far. So what the cerebellum will do? The cerebellum is going to correct it and bring it back to the bottle's place. If it is not stopped, what will happen? He will be coming to the opposite direction. So this second dampening effect is to stop the action of cerebellum. It does not want the cerebellum to perform the correction also to a greater extent or a over correction. And this Purkinje fiber has a one tremendous and beautiful effect that is it learns with errors. For example, whenever we are trying to learn a new skill like playing a badminton or tennis, what will happen? Initially, we will be making a lot of mistakes. But on the due course, what happens is most of our shots are trained and we play it subconsciously without ourselves knowing that we are going to hit the ball correctly. So how does this happen is because constant feedback to the Purkinje, what it will do is it will self-learn. This Purkinje system learns to correct the error. So this Purkinje fiber tunes the entire system to anticipate and correct the errors even before it is happening. So that's how the Purkinje system is very beautiful and it learns to from the errors. I hope it's clear. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the next lecture of cerebellum where we discuss the cerebellar dysfunctions and cerebellar functions. If you like my content, kindly share it to your friends. Thank you so much.